Spontaneity. Spontaneity is a, a really important thing in life. And for a moment, just think back over your life and for some of the unplanned, wonderful things that may have happened. There are probably a bunch if you think about it. Years and years ago, I had a, a friend. I, I wish I knew what happened to her, but she had a, a phrase, this friend of mine, and she would always say, just because. It was a phrase that I really learned to appreciate. Just because. You, you're taking a driving trip down a road and you, you see an exit sign with an unusual name. And so you exit, just because. Or you're working in the kitchen, cooking up this fabulous recipe and your eyes catch the glimpse of an off recipe ingredient. So you decide just to toss it in, just because. Or you're taking a run down the mountain in a normal year and you catch a glimpse of stash, powder. And so you decide to take that run on a run you've never taken before. Just because. Well, without a doubt, I believe spontaneity is, is the spice of life. Without spontaneity, things would be really mundane, if not boring and dull, wouldn't they? But as I think about spontaneity, there's, there's a bit of a paradox, because if there was only spontaneity, if there was no such thing as preparation, if everything were lived spontaneously, I have a hunch that our day in and day out living would be a complete and utter mess. We all know if you want a meaningful vocation in life, it takes a ton of preparation. If you want to raise healthy, adjusted children, you can't leave it all to chance. If you want some stability in retirement, you have to plan. Without it, it's disastrous. And can you imagine having a baby with no preparation? Not seeing a doctor, not adjusting your diet, not at least reading something about what might be ahead? Planning ahead, preparation, anticipation, these are critical concepts for living. Just as an aside, 24 years ago, Regina and I decided to get married. Actually, we, we knew from the very beginning of our relationship that that was going to happen. But one day, I proposed. And as a result of that, we put a date on the calendar. And when we made that commitment, plans were set in motion. And because we were expecting that date, our entire lives were affected from pre-marriage counseling to establishing invitation lists to picking out things that young marrying couples do. Nearly every day for six months, our lives were shaped by that future date. Our daily discussions and decisions about not only our wedding, but our future life together shaped who we were and how we interacted with each other and the choices that we made each and every day. And that time before the wedding defined who we were becoming and what we would be after the service itself. Yes, planning, getting ready, anticipating are so important to so many areas in life. And I, I wonder, are there some things that, that you're looking forward to? Are there some events or passages or happenings on the near or distant horizon? And if so, if there's something in your future that you're anticipating, there is a good chance that it's affecting your whole life because what's interesting is that when you expect something, it creates a vision for you to focus on. It helps to get you organized. It helps you to get things done. It means that you care about something. And when you care about something, when you look forward to something, when you are expecting something to happen, it affects your entire being. So as I reflect upon this, I have to ask a question for all of us to think about. How much planning do we do? How much of a sense of anticipation do we live with? How are our lives and choices and interactions with other people moment to moment, moment to moment, affected by a sense of anticipation and expectation that Jesus will come again, maybe even right now? Just to restate, to what, degree, what, to what degree do each of us live with a sense of anticipation and even expectation that Jesus will one day come again? Maybe even today. Well, a tough question, it's a question I believe that we're compelled to think about, not only because it's Advent, but because 
The second coming is central to what it means to be a Christian. And it's a challenging question. And it's challenging because it can change our lives if we think about it and more importantly act upon it. Just for the heck of, uh, just for the heck of it, a few weeks ago at a staff meeting, I looked around at our staff and I asked the staff if we spend enough time thinking about the fact that Jesus could come at any moment. And if not, why not? And if so, how does it affect who we are as a staff and what we plan and who we are? Our gospel reading today is from Luke. It's a great reading. It's a complicated reading because it's dealing with a bunch of different issues. And one of the issues that it deals with is something that happened in history. And just to give you a little bit of background, some of you already know this, but in the year 70, the Romans decimated the temple in Jerusalem. Absolutely decimated it. Blew it apart, ripped it apart, tore it down. Now this building was amazingly beautiful, and it was the centerpiece of Judaism the centerpiece of the identity of the Jews in Jerusalem. It represented many, many things, including the favor of God that the people believed was upon them. And for it to have been destroyed would have shaken that culture, its identity, to its absolute core. This is a very minor comparison, but think about a foreign army coming to the United States and the U.S. Capitol building being blown up. It's a very minor comparison, but think of what a symbol that is and what it would mean for us to see that happen. Well, as history went, the temple was destroyed, and in Luke, Jesus is reminding his followers, look, there's a really bad time ahead, a really, really bad time. It's going to be a bad time for you, and it's going to be a bad time for anybody that has chosen to follow me. He's talking to his followers about the destruction of the temple and what lies ahead to try to prepare them so that they anticipate it. But there's something else going on in this reading today, which is also found in similar versions in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. And what's going on is a reference to the second coming of Christ. Now, the word for this is parousia, parousia. It's, it's a Greek word which means which means presence or arrival, or interestingly enough, visit. Parousia means presence, arrival, or visit. And the reason that the second coming or the parousia is a theme in Advent, which I've mentioned several times, begins today, is because the word itself, Advent, means coming. It's the time of year that we get ready to celebrate the first coming and the birth of Christ, but it's also the time of year in which we remind ourselves about the importance of being prepared for Christ's second coming. Wow, the second coming. Talk about mystery. Talk about the, some, something that there's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding and questions about. I think that there's a lot of mystery around the second coming. And my personal bias is if you run into somebody that says that they totally get it, totally understand it, totally understand all the details, and exactly when it's going to happen, run the other way. <laughs> but I don't think that totally getting it is what it's all about anyway. Rather, what it's important is to trust what Scripture says. And what Scripture says is that one day Christ is going to come again and set everything that is wrong right. One day, Christ will come again and set everything that is wrong right. I hope so. I hope so. There's so much pain, so much suffering, so much despair, not only across the globe, but even deeply within our own hearts and histories. The message of the second coming is that there will be a day when God will make everything that is wrong and amiss on the planet and in your life and in your heart and in your soul and in your relationships right. Now such a time is not something to be afraid of as a follower of Christ, but rather something to welcome. 
Now, it's important to point out that Scripture makes it clear that before Christ's second coming, that there are going to be lots of problems, wars, earthquakes, political upheaval, social upheaval, lots of bad stuff that goes on, caused frequently by bad decisions people make and even, even evil itself. History certainly shows this. But Scripture is crystal clear. Jesus made it crystal clear that those who state no when the end is coming don't know what they're talking about. Jesus says it explicitly in the Gospels. I sometimes now hear people say, you know, things really seem bad now. I think the end is coming. Really? That's not what Scripture says. And frankly, things have been equally bad since time began. Well, for a few moments, I'd like to take a look at the second coming and what it might mean in our lives right now. So what? What's the relevance of it? And to do this, I'd like to ask you to imagine something just for a moment. Move yourself to tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m. I don't know what your alarm clock sounds like, but imagine that sound in your head. Now, as you're imagining along with me and as you stir, open your eyes... And as you open your eyes, an overwhelming realization comes into your consciousness. You know that today is the day that Jesus is coming back to set everything in order. If this was a reality tomorrow morning, what would you do with your day? What would you not do? What might you do that you typically wouldn't even consider? Would you open a bottle of bubbly? Would you take a few runs in places you've never attempted? Do you go to work or not? Do you make amends with people with whom you have broken relationships? Do you apologize to people for misdeeds? Do you come clean with who you are with people? Do you get in touch with your hurts? Do you let your defenses go? Do you become more loving? Do you hug more? Do you say thank you to people around? Do you compliment people? Do you upbuild people? Do you share your assets? Do you give thanks? Do you pray? Do you tweet your friends? Do you share your faith in ways you wouldn't have considered before because you know today is the day? And if you knew that God was going to change everything, what would you do differently over the next 24 hours? And here's the crux of the matter. If you're not doing those things every day now, why not? You see, it's pretty clear throughout Scripture that God wants us to live with the expectation and the anticipation that today might be the day that he comes to right every wrong. Now, there's some critical caveats to this. First, long ago, there were some people that were so convinced that Jesus' return was imminent that they quit working and they sat around doing nothing. And Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, chastises people who are doing this. His point was, live each day knowing that Jesus could return, but live each day fully meeting responsibilities and plan for tomorrow. Christ may not come back today or tomorrow or the next or 20 years from now, and so work, serve, love, and plan for the future. Wake up each morning anticipating that Christ will come again, but live each day with the full expectation that God right now is acting and intervening and working in your life for good in the meantime. Another caveat is that we're not to take Christ's second coming as invitation to live life going after a first-class bucket list. Do things you've never dreamed of. Live large. Go for it. Seek adventure in life. God wants you to do those things. But this is vastly different from living a self-serving, hedonistically driven life. And over the course of time, and even around us now, there are those who have chosen and those who choose to live their lives in a self-serving way, eating, drinking, and being merry without anything else. A third caveat, and this is not easy to hear, but Jesus was surrounded in his day, like we are in our day, by people who not only denied God, but ignored the possibility of the second coming. And Jesus has some really strong words. He gets started by saying, watch out that no one deceives you. 
Keep watch because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. And then he gets into some very uncomfortable yet clear consequences when we choose to ignore, deny, or thumb our noses at God. But I want to get back to the key point, the key Advent point. If you knew that God was coming and was going to change everything tomorrow, what would you do differently over the next 24 hours? And if you don't do those things now, why not? Now, I'm not asking this question to make any of us feel guilty or scared or less than or inadequate or remorseful, but rather to focus and to get clear on what it is that is shaping our day in and day out life. What anticipations are shaping you? What expectations are shaping you? Is the coming of Christ one of them? So we have weeks ahead until we celebrate and give God thanks for the birth of Christ. And I, I pray that this Advent will be different for us, that it'll be a powerful time for us. I pray and hope that all of us are going to struggle and ponder and pray about the second coming and to be attentive to how our daily lives are shaped by Christ right now. All of us, all of us, even me, we get distracted by responsibilities and stresses and strains and things to get gone, done. We, we feel overwhelmed by the duties of each and every day. But I pray that you reconnect with God during this Advent. That you wake up each morning trusting that God is acting in your life today. That you wake up each morning filled with the hope and encouragement that comes from knowing that God is in charge until he comes again. And I pray that over the next few weeks that we will wake up each morning and say to ourselves, perhaps today, perhaps today, the Lord will come. Watch how that shapes 